Wild Talents, by Charles Hoyfort, Chapter 7c. The most widely known case of cattle mutilation is that in which was involved a young lawyer, George Ed Algy, son of the Hindu, who was a clergyman in the village of Wyrley, Staffordshire. The first of a series of outrages occurred upon the night of February 2nd, 1903. A valuable horse was raped. Then, at intervals, up to August 27th, there were mutilations of horses, cows, and sheep. Suspicion was directed to Ed Algy because of anonymous letters accusing him. After the mutilation of the horse, August 27th, Ed Algy was arrested. The police searched his house and, according to them, found an old coat upon which were bloodstains. In the presence of Ed Algy's parents and his sister, the police said that there were horse hairs upon this coat. The coat was taken to the police station, where Dr. Butler, the police surgeon, examined it, reporting that upon it he had found 29 horse hairs. The police said that shoes worn by Ed Algy exactly fitted tracks in the field, where the horse had been mutilated. They learned that the young man had been away from home that night, taking a walk, as told by him. The case against Ed Algy convinced a jury, which found him guilty, and he was sentenced to seven years, penal servitude. I now have a theory that our existence is a phantom, that it died, long ago, probably of old age, that the thing is a ghost. So the unreality of its composition, its phantom justice and make-believe juries and incredible judges. There seems to be a ghostly justice surviving in the old spook, having the ghost's liking for public appearances, at times. Let there be publicity enough, and justice prevails. In the Dreyfus case, when the attention of the world is attracted, justice, after much delay, and after a fashion, appears. Probably in the prison with Ed Algy were other prisoners who had been sent there, about as he had been sent. They stayed there. But Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, with much publicity, took up Ed Algy's case. In his account, in Great Stories of Real Life, Boyle says that when the police inspector found the old coat upon which, according to him, there were horse hairs, Mrs. Ed Algy and Miss Ed Algy examined it and denied that there was a horse hair upon it. That Ed Algy's father said, You can take a coat. I am satisfied that there is no horse hair on it. Boyle's statements imply that somewhere near the police station was a stable. As to the statement that Ed Algy's shoes exactly fitted tracks in the field where the horse was ripped, Boyle says that the outrage occurred just outside a large colliery and that hundreds of excited miners had swarmed over the place, making it impossible to pick out any one track. Because of Doyle's disclosures, so it is said, or because of the publicity, the government appointed a committee to investigate, and the report of this committee was that Ed Algy had been wrongfully convicted. Sometimes slashers of cattle have been caught, and, when called upon to explain, have said that they had obeyed an irresistible impulse. The better educated of these and resisting ones transform the rude word slasher into vivisectionist, and, instead of sneaking into fields at night, work at regular hours in their laboratories. There are persons who wonder at the state of mind of the people in general, back in times when the torture of humans was sanctioned. The guts of a man were dragged out for the glory of God, abdominal exploration of the dog is for the glory of science. The state of mind that was, and the state of mind that is, are about the same, and the unpleasant features of anything are glossed over, so long as mainly anything is glorious. According to a reconsideration by the English government, in the Ed Algy case, the slasher of cattle at Wyrley remained uncaught. In the summer of 1907, in the same region, again there was slashing.